Hello, my name is Andy Versosa. I'm Executive Director of Stanley Whitman House. Today I have Tony Grigo of the Connecticut Witch Memorial page on Facebook. He's going to talk to us about how and why he started the page, and he'll talk to us about the Connecticut witch trials, those accused and in some cases hung for being a witch in 17th century colonial Connecticut. We're doing these presentations, this will be one of three, on the occasion of Mary Barnes hanging on January 25th, 1663. She was a Farmington resident, and at the time, Farmington was called Tunxus Plantation. She was accused and subsequently hung in Hartford. So on that introduction, again, I want to welcome you to Stanley Whitman House. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to hearing about how you got involved with this aspect of history and uh, what we can learn about what you're doing with the Connecticut Witch Memorial page on Facebook. Well, thank you for having me here. And um, I started with history back in 1981 when I was on the New Haven Police Department. I was in the Grove Street Cemetery um, on a Sunday morning, reading the paper and having a cup of coffee on my break. And a caretaker came up to me and said, have you ever seen the policeman's gravestone? I said, no. And he took me over to a portion of the cemetery and there was a very large, it was probably about 10, 12 feet tall, brownstone monument that said the name Thomas Cummings died November 24th, 1855, in the performance of his duties as a policeman. I thought that was interesting because the police department wasn't formed until 1861. So I started to do some research, reading some history books about the police department. None of them mentioned the Thomas Cummings. Well, I then went to the Beinecke Rare Books, which is part of Yale University, and looked at the original newspapers. Thomas Cummings was a member of the Night Watch, which was formed in eight, uh, 1640 for, uh, uh, you know, watching out for fires and uh, Native Americans and uh, a law, a law uh, enforcement. And he died as a result of a brawl he was involved in in 1855. Now the police department wasn't formed until 1861. So I decided to start to research his whole story, which I did. When I completed that, I decided to uh, look further. And in reality, there were 17 other police officers who had died in the line of, line of duty, and I documented all their cases. So, that's how I started learning about research and, and doing uh, history. Well, by 1992, I was on vacation up in New Hampshire with my wife, and we decided to take a day trip to Salem, Massachusetts. So I went there and um, fascinated by the wealth of information that was there and uh, the old buildings that still existed. And I started studying the Salem trials. But when I got back to Connecticut, I went to the library, the Milford Library, and in addition to finding information on Salem, I found a book written by Richard Tomlinson about the Connecticut witch trials. So up to this point, you had not any awareness no, of Connecticut witches? had no knowledge of any trials in Connecticut. So I read his book and I started to do some uh, in, uh, research on it and what I discovered there was many people that were accused of witchcraft. Eleven of those people were hanged. There was nine uh, women, uh, two men, both of them husbands of convicted witches, who were hanged. And that's how I started into that process. So when you were discovering that there were witches in Connecticut, some accused and some of those hung, had you 
any awareness of the, the, the which hysteria that was that had happened in Europe previous to that? Were you aware of the 300 years of um, you know, persecutions of witches in, in Europe before? Oh yes, I, you know, I had research out also, and there's, there's a lot more information about the witch trials in uh, Europe, and in most of those cases, uh, they were either hanged or burned. Um, that, in here in Connecticut, it was English law. And their method of execution was hanging. So when you started your research into Connecticut witches, you started approximately, what, what year was that? Well, like I said, it was first it was in uh, 1992, but in 2005, I attended a lecture in Torrington given by our state historian Walter Woodward on the Connecticut witch trials. I went there with several friends and uh, he spoke about all the trials. Well, after he was done speaking, several people in the group uh, approached him and asked if the state of Connecticut had ever done anything to clear their names or a proclamation or a memorial. And he says, no, he says, but it sounds like an interesting idea. So uh, a group of people, we kind of formed a, 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 an ad hoc committee to see if we couldn't get something accomplished in Connecticut for all the people that were hanged. And uh, we actually held an event uh, in, uh, on May 26th of, uh, in 2007 for Alice Young, who was the first person hanged for witchcraft in Connecticut. We held that event at uh, the South Green in Hartford, which has a connection to the tr not only the trials but the witches themselves because uh, on one night a group of them, uh, I, I think it was during the Christmas season, um, had a party, did some drinking and so forth. Well, out of that uh, two people were charged with witchcraft, a uh, husband and wife, uh, Nathaniel and Rebecca Nurse, uh, Nurse, um, that's Salem, uh, Greensmith. Right. And they were hanged along with Mary Barnes. Right. 1663? Yes. Right. Right. So when I, when I think about your past being a, a, a policeman and, and, and maybe in your line of work looking at evidence and, and you know, investigating things and gathering information, mm -hmm. um, how did that play in your newfound interest in, in the witch trials? Well, I did, I found it very interesting that um, there was a couple of cases where people confessed to being witches. They confessed to practicing witch, witchcraft with others. And I, I, I found it uh, difficult to understand why would people confess. Now here in the colonies, we didn't torture people. Um, that was common practice in Europe. Not here. So why would you why would you uh, confess to these crimes? Not only that, in the Greensmith case, uh, Rebecca admitted to being a witch, but she also implicated her husband. Well, I'm thinking about the accusers and what their motivation would be. Did you have any insight into that in your research? Well, there's several cases where uh, bizarre situations where somebody's cow died and they maybe had an issue with a neighbor, so they accuse a witch, the, the neighbor, of causing the death of the cow because they're practicing witchcraft. Uh, there was a case in New Haven where a woman sold a chicken to a neighbor, and the neighbor discovered that the chicken was loaded with worms, and she accused the seller of being a witch. It's interesting. Uh, my predecessor, Lisa Johnson, who was a director, wrote a play called The Preternatural Way. And in that, she tells the story, or the story is told of Mary Barnes, her uh, being accused and then her uh, eventually being hung. And in that, there are a number of strikes against her that are, are um, you know, how the, the play is composed and how it, 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 it progresses. So I, I always think about you know, both the accused and the accusers. And uh, of course, you know, I, I couldn't help but 
you know, be interested in your opinion, what your thoughts, being a, a former policeman, about um, how these things might come about, what the psychology was, what the dynamics, what the motivations would be. Well, one of the things in the very beginning of the trials, it only took one person for an accusation. And uh, based on one person's accusation, somebody could be charged with a crime of witchcraft. But it, uh, it became uh, so b bizarre, um, many of the cases when you read them you say, why, why did that happen? Why, did, why was this person accused? And that's part of it. But going along now, um, in 2008, this group of people who tried to get something accomplished with the state, uh, were able to put a bill before the General Assembly in 2008. There was three descendants there. Um, they, if you've ever testified before the General Assembly, you have three minutes to testify. But then they can ask you questions. Well, these three descendants testified and answered questions for 45 minutes. And the bill never made it to the floor and wasn't passed. We tried again in 2009, again we were unsuccessful and never passed. So during that point, the group sort of kind of disassembled because we weren't getting, uh, we weren't getting anywhere with our, our hopes to get some kind of recognition for the trials. Were you looking for recognition or were you looking for exoneration? Well, well originally we were looking for, we bounced around with a whole bunch of terms. Um, the first thing was, one of the things that we looked into was a pardon. Now, These would be pardons for the crimes committed at that time. Exactly. Right? Well, what we found, unlike Massachusetts and other states, where the governor has the authority to pardon people, and even now our president pardons people, uh, Connecticut doesn't have that in place. There's a board of pardons and paroles. So I wrote to the Board of Pardons and Paroles and I explained to them what I was trying to accomplish to get a pardon for these people. And they wrote me back a nice letter saying, basically, we don't pardon dead people. So that's where we were, we were at. I even went so far at, at one point, I don't recall the exact date, I wrote to the Queen of England because in the 1600s we were under the authority of the crown. Right, these would have been subjects of the crown, right. Well, I got a nice letter from the staff. I don't think it was from the queen, but it was from the staff. And they said, in order for the queen to issue a pardon for anybody accused of witchcraft, all their trials would have to be reopened. And I knew that was impossible because in Connecticut, so many of the trial records are gone. And the staff also indicated we think it should be, uh, the Colonials should handle that. So the next thing that I uh, looked into, the governor of the state has what they call the governor's proclamation. I'm sure you've seen them, we've all seen them. You go to somebody's retirement dinner and there's a governor's proclamation recognizing your years of service. Well, I started to write, it was Governor Malloy at the time, I wrote to him several times and he never responded. So that, um, that kind of went by the wayside. So uh, I want to just go back to the fact that these were crimes and there wasn't a lot of evidence that was available to you today to look at. And you say that the evidence, did it exist, did it not exist, did it disappear, and existed at one time? Could you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I, yes. I think um, m most of the evidence here in Connecticut was based on um, transcripts from the accusers. I don't think there was really any physical evidence, like in... Uh, I think there was a case in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, where they, during a search of a accused witch's home, they found poppets or little dolls, which mm -hmm. are used in witchcraft, and that's physical evidence. But not so much here in Connecticut. Mostly uh, uh, they took transcripts from uh, 
depositions from certain people, and that's what the, the evidence is. Okay. So the Connecticut Witch Memorial Facebook page is really important because there has not been recognition uh, or clearing of the names of these people that were accused of witchcraft here in Connecticut. Right. So tell me a little bit about what the response has been through the Facebook page. Like what, who's joined the page or liked the page and, and what's, what would you find there? Well, let me, uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, November 3rd uh, in 2015, I happened to be in a store and I picked up the Hartford Current. And on page three, there was an article that just jumped out at me, the first witch hanged in Connecticut. And the article was about an author by the name of Beth Caruso, who wrote a book on, the, uh, on Alice Young, the first person hanged for witchcraft. Um, but her and I started talking about what I was trying to do, what she was trying to do, so she actually set up the Facebook page for us back in February, I think it was February 16th of uh, 2016. And right from the very beginning, uh, I would write a short story about one individual that was charged for witchcraft. And I bounced around to all different ones. But what started to develop, we started to get a lot of hits, a lot of likes, and mostly people would send us a message saying, well, I'm the eighth descendant of so-and-so. So what we found, I thought was interesting, there's thousands of descendants of the, of the people here in, in Connecticut charged with witchcraft. So I'm thinking about if I was a descendant of a witch, what I might think about my legacy. Um, could you share a little bit of insight about what you've learned from the descendants that have, you've met through the Facebook page? Well, there's, there's two lines of thought on that. There's some people that um, they find it's fascinating that they have this uh, loose cannon in the family tree, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then there are other people that feel that their ancestor was wrongly treated. She would, she or he was hung for witchcraft. And they were appreciative of what we were doing to try and get some kind of recognition through the state of Connecticut. So history matters. Right, exactly. And every life matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look back, in some cases, uh, there were children that were orphaned because mom and dad both got hanged. I mean, it's, uh, it's really interesting, fascinating. So you brought a few things that you were going to share that you wrote for the Connecticut Witch Memorial Facebook page. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about it and, and sharing what you brought? Well, I have two cases here that I, I, I always find interesting. Uh, I've talked to different people about it. And I think the most bizarre case is Lydia Gilbert. Now, um, Windsor, Connecticut, back in 1651, the train band, which is an old colonial term for a military band of men who practice military tactics. But well, one day in 1651, they're out marching. And one fellow's musket uh, accidentally discharges and kills the guy in front of him. Henry Stiles dies. Thomas Allen was charged with um, uh, today would be called um, manslaughter. Manslaughter. He's fined twenty dollars, uh, twenty pounds, and he can't carry a musket for a year. 16, Sounds reasonable, right? Sixteen fifty one. In sixteen fifty four, Lydia Gilbert is charged with causing the death of Thomas Allen by witchcraft. Now, we don't have any confirmation that she was hanged, but being found guilty of that crime, the sentence is hanging. So we believe she was hanged. Okay, wow. And, and what was her association with Mr. Stiles? Well, I think, um, uh, I, I want to say it was um, Thomas Allen, who was a t 
tenant in her home. So there was some kind of connection there. In colonial times, people would take other people in to earn extra money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he may have been, well, he was a tenant in her home. It's always uh, interesting to try to figure out what the motivation was when someone was accused from the accuser and, and the circumstances. So that's why I'm asking. Well, there's, there's a lot more to that case because uh, uh, Thomas Allen's father was uh, sort of a dignitary in the town. So, I mean, his son was charged with this crime. He was fine, couldn't carry a musket for a, uh, a year. Um, so they found a scapegoat. Well, the legal that's, I can't say that for sure, but it certainly looks that way. Hmm. And what else did you bring us today? Well, I brought a case out of, out of New Haven. And to New Haven Colony's credit, they had witch trials, but they never hanged anybody. So even though they were the same, cut from the same cloth Puritans, there was a different uh, thought process there. But one of the cases I find interesting, and there's two prominent cases in New Haven. The one I described earlier with the chickens was a woman. And the second case is a fellow by the name of John Brown. Now, John Brown lived in New Haven. Uh, he had a couple of brothers. He was in and out of court for being drunk. So he was, a, he was no stranger to the court. But anyway, one night he decides, in the middle of the night, he gets two of his friends and one of, they travel out to, uh, it's now East Haven, Connecticut but originally it was part of New Haven. And he wakes up this Hitchcock family to get him something to eat. So the, the, the Hitchcock boys put together something to eat and one of the boys says to John Brown, you're a sailor and I understand that sailors can call the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Brown answers, yeah, he, I can. I need a piece of paper, a compass, and a light. So the, one, the Hitchcock boy gets the uh, tools for him. He proceeds to talk, placing all these circles on the page and talking about the 11th house, the 12th house, and the 13th house. He's talking about astrology. And he says to him, what color devil would you like me to call? So Hitchcock says, well, a brown one. Okay, I can do that. So he writes on the paper with a few more symbols and he goes outside and he's chanted a few words and then he suddenly runs back into the house and throws the paper into the fireplace and burns it. He says, if I didn't do that, the devil I called would come to here and burn this house down. Mm. So I'm sure they were probably drinking. Well, the story gets back. He's called into court again. His father joins him. He's charged with tempting God. He's fined and he's released. But he ends up getting in, in trouble a couple more times with the court. And at some point, he went off on one of his sailing trips and never returned. And his wife uh, sued, for, uh, sued him for desertion. Mm -hmm. Divorced him. And so it, it's, to me, when you're, when you're looking into these things, how do, they, how do these stories come to you? You're just, someone tells you about them, you're part of your research. Mostly research. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and where are you, I guess, are you in libraries? Are you getting periodicals? Uh, tell me a little bit about how you might be coming by these stories. Well, there's really, uh, there's some books written here about uh, witch trials here in Connecticut. Uh, John M. Taylor wrote the first really documented book about the trials in 1908. Mm -hmm. uh, years later, the, another gentleman by the name of Richard Tomlinson uh, also wrote a book on the trials. So. Those of you, uh, there's other articles that I've uh, read in older books, but there's so many names that they left out. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, there's, I think there's one account where somebody makes the statement about Salem, but we never did that here in Connecticut. So it's, it's fascinating, and uh, I, I don't know why, well, I, I have theories, uh, why the records disappeared. They were embarrassed by what took place here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I'm, I'm happy to meet you and have you be part of uh, our observance of Mary Barnes being hung on January 25th. Um, it'll be the 358th anniversary on that day. Um, we'll have uh, Beth Caruso uh, speak with us and do a presentation much like yours today. And then also we'll have uh, an act, a one-act play by um, Virginia Woolf of Her Story Theater. She'll also give some commentary about that. And then all three of you will be part of a panel discussion on Monday, January 25th at 7 p.m. and uh, we'll follow that with a live discussion, um, kind of a, a, a Zoom uh, reception. Yes. Uh, these are those days, right? Yeah. And um, I just want to quickly look over my notes. I, I, I know that I'm very grateful for you being here today and, and your time sharing you. with us uh, your, your, your experience with researching the Connecticut witch trials. and. Um, do you have any advice for people who are going to look at this chapter of Connecticut's history? Well, if people that are interested in the trials, there's a wealth of information on, on the computers. Years ago, you had to rely on books. Today, you go on a computer and find out anything about anything. Right. And uh, I find that in most cases, most of the people that, who visit our Connecticut Witch Memorial page uh, are descendants. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of descendants, uh, as I said, across America. And hopefully, we'll tap that resource, when, hopefully when we get close to uh, trying to accomplish something here in Connecticut. We've had some successes, by the way. In um, 2017, the town of Windsor, the mayor, Donald Trinks, uh, Beth Caruso and a few other people, the first church in Windsor, met with the town council of Windsor. They presented their case for a proclamation for two uh, residents of uh, Windsor, Lydia Gilbert, who I spoke of, and uh, Alice Young. And it was passed 9-0 to zero unanimously to clear their names in Windsor. Our other success was by a group in, uh, called the 375th Anniversary of Black Rock. Right, this was down in Bridgeport. I right. might have seen you down there. Yes, they put up a wonderful stone monument with a plaque on it. So that's our, another success. That was for Goody Knapp. Goody Knapp. Yeah. Yeah. Goody Knapp, by the way, her case is interesting because a lot of what we know about the trials came from a defamation lawsuit that she was involved in. And rather than look at witchcraft trials, you get your information from a defamation suit. Interesting. So there's different ways of finding information, not necessarily directly, but you can sometimes find it around right. something. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here. We're here at Stanley Whitman House in preparation of uh, marking the 358th anniversary or uh, hanging of, of Mary Barnes of Farmington. And uh, we'll see you on the 25th for the, the Zoom panel and the Zoom reception. So again, thank you, Tony. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for sharing.